Thank you for joining us. My name is Christina Caesar, and I manage marketing and communications at Synergy Technical, and I have the honor of moderating today's session. Um, today's topic is a big one. AI. It's like the hottest topic on the planet right now. Um, and just a reminder, the webinar is being recorded, and if you have any questions or comments, please drop them in the Q&A function within Teams. However, disclaimer, we do already have so much to cover, so I'm so sorry. If we do not get to one of your questions, I promise that we will connect you with the right person. Make sure you get it answered as soon as possible. So just really quick, a little bit about us. Synergy Technical was founded in 2011 and is headquartered in Richmond, Virginia. We're an IT consulting firm with clients in over 70 countries in all 50 states, and we manage over 3 million licenses of Microsoft 365. There are licensing managers. And I'm going to be quick with the um, intro because I know you all have great stuff to cover. And with that, I will introduce our speakers. Uh, so Adrian Amos, has actually been with Synergy since its inception in 2011, which actually honestly the inception of the cloud. So you've watched the technology landscape change insanely. I have, yes. I, I was brought in to Synergy as the first technical resource because I was one of the first people to push workloads into the cloud back when the cloud itself was every bit as, well, perceivably laughable as we've thought of AI in the last few years. So it's it's really fascinating to be back in this like precipice of a whole new era of landscape of technology again. Yeah. yeah. Um, but he is one of our best solutions architects. He has specializations in both productivity and security and has led CIEs at Microsoft Ignite for several years, conferences and roadshows, honestly, around the world. Um, and both him at, and Lexi, who I'll introduce next, actually already have their Microsoft AI certifications. They got them as soon as they came out. So I promise they know their stuff. You're in good hands. Um, and with the final one, she's Mike who is our technical analyst. And basically, her job, she, her job is just basically to know what's going on all the time in the technology world. She makes sure the company stays up to date on every product announcement, feature update. It's honestly amazing watching how much information your brain can consume. It's so impressive. Uh, but she actually does also have a lot of uh, Microsoft security specializations and certificates, as does Adrian. Uh, and she was actually just named the Richmond Technology Council's 2023 Rising Star winner for, honestly, used to use to exemplify. Great, <laughs> she's blushing over here. Great potential uh, as a woman in technology. And with that, I promise you're doing good stuff. Um, we'll kick things off with the first question. And Lexi, I'm going to start with you. We'll start from the ground up. What is AI and how did we learn? So you can't consume any form of media, whether it be news, social media, you know, TikTok, anything without hearing something about AI. Um, there's a million different forms of AI, it seems, um, but you're going to hear about it. Um, so the distinction I want to make here is that Microsoft Copilot isn't just ChatGPT or any of these generative AIs or more, I guess, approachable AIs that we've kind of been seeing because AI has been around for a while, like Adrian will touch on. Um, but ChatGPT and Copilot are, ChatGPT is the foundation for Copilot and OpenAI. Um, but so what Copilot will do is its knowledge base is actually your environment. So rather than it being an internal chat bot that pulls from Google, um, it's going to be basing its knowledge on your environment and the documents that are available to you as a person. Um, so you can ask it, what is our acceptable use policy? And it can respond to you in a human-like behavior based on documents that it was trained on, which again, we'll get into a little bit later. Um, so it's more cohesive than just a chat bot and um, it's really great and does a lot of the automations and tasks that you might need it to do. So that's your own idea of Copilot and ChatGBT. Yeah, yeah, I'm gonna, side. Well, I'm actually going to zoom out to yes. kind of 50,000 feet and just talk, like talk about AI as like a broad scope kind of concept, right? Broad mm -hmm. stroke concept. So um, just like when, you know, we, we started talking about cloud again 12 years ago, uh, it, yeah, it, it was a laughable idea because the reality was the cloud was just somebody else's computer, right? It was just a cloud, a cloud resource was a computer you didn't actually have the ability to go push the power button on. Well, AI has been kind of used in that same sort of general sense of like we just associate it with technology that's too difficult for us to understand, so it's just AI. But the reality is there's a few basic components that comprise AI. And just like with the cloud a dozen years ago, I was very hesitant to lean into these terms for a long time. But the reality is that, that AI is 
um, it, it's going to be a combination of machine learning. It's going to be large language model processing. Uh, in some specialized instances, it's going to be vision and speech analysis. It's going to be able to look at complex data sets and draw linear regression or classification or clustering models. And what really makes it AI and not just specified computer workloads that are difficult for us to understand is when we can take some form of a query, allow data set to be reasoned over, and then take the results of that and push it into something else that can also determine what's the best way to reason over that data and then produce a meaningful result. At that point, you're crossing so many boundaries of these specialized computer models. What else do you call it, right? If you're not going to call it AI, what are you going to call it? And, and I, I keep hearing all these like, various uh, people saying like, oh, we shouldn't call it AI until it can handle emotion. We shouldn't handle it AI until it can do mm -hmm. these things. I think these benchmarks are, are completely arbitrary, right? What we have is, is the ability to take data, reason over it, model a result, compare that result against what we expected, train it to do better, and then deliver results that, that we simply could not do or, or don't have the time to do any other way. So, you know, all the all the arguing on the internet about was it AI really it, functionally it is. And and I think I think we can put that argument to rest. And for the co-pilot perspective, you're absolutely right. You know, being able to ask it in natural language, what is the 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 thing that I'm looking for and having it be able to pull that back. It doesn't matter if it's just a large language model. It doesn't matter if it's just machine learning. It's the ability to put those things together and to pull back something meaningful that allows you to go from worrying about the process to just worrying about the outcome. That's that's what AI is doing for us. And I'm excited. I mean, like, you know, I, I, just like the cloud again years ago, like I was like, oh, I don't want to do this. This is dumb, right? But no, with AI, it's very much the same kind of like mental tripping. And when I realized I was doing that mental tripping over it, I was like, wait a minute. That means that I need to get off of my high horse, right? <laughs> and dig into this and figure out what's actually doing. And and it, it's been astonishing seeing the way that even in my job, which is largely experimental, uh, I, I, I've been able to find processes that I am desperate to automate and and they don't automate well with simple automation tools and AI will do it for me. Well, so that actually is a perfect lead into the next question that I think everyone is wondering is, is AI coming from my job? So we've had uh, decades of, of entertainment and media built around the idea that AI is coming to end the world, right? Mm -hmm. um, the Terminator series, the Matrix series, right? You look at it, even Dune is written in a, in a world that is post AI, right? Yeah. Where the, the, the Mentats walking around doing the human calculations. Um, the reality is that, that we have been steeped in culture around this idea that AI is not here to do good things, it is here to destroy. And so it is very easy to extrapolate from that, that AI is here to take our jobs, right? Because it's allowing us to, to get to those results more quickly and more meaningfully. Um, but I don't think it's intended to do that. And I honestly don't think in ethical implementations, it will. I think what AI does is just like I mentioned a minute ago, it allows you to go from worrying about the process to worrying about the outcome. And if I if I specifically think about scenarios where where like where that's been meaningful for me, you know, uh, it, it every time I sit down to write a PowerShell script to do something, which is rare, I don't do much PowerShell these days. I have to remember how to get into PowerShell. I have to remember what are the code snippets. I have to try to remember what is the way that I do this. What are the switches I have to run for this PowerShell code? With generative AI, I can simply say, write me a PowerShell script that does X, Y, and Z. I still have to validate that it's right. But like I'm focused on outcomes, I'm not yeah. focused on process. And we had a similar conversation this morning when you were talking about the difference in generations and that you had to learn how to code, but now. <laughs> yeah, and I wasn't sure if we were going to go into that. <laughs> I mean, you kind of like let us right into it. I'm yeah, sure. so so yeah, and that's it's a it's a salient point, right? So like I I've been reading a lot lately about how Lexi <laughs> and her generation yeah, are yeah. among the first yeah, that that haven't had that hands-on experience with starting with code, right? Mm -hmm. Like, you know, in 1983, when I was in the second grade, we went to a computer lab every Thursday and we learned how to code in Logo. We made the, the turtle turn left, go a certain number of steps, turn right. It was, it was, you know, it was, that was what we did. Uh, and so like everything that I have done has been based on this, this knowledge base that mm -hmm. goes back to me being eight years old 
and having started with code. And you know, you look at at, at people, uh, young people today, and as not an ageism discussion at all, but it's true that you are in a generation that simply picks up technology and expects it to work. And so, if you don't have that forty years worth. 40 years, 40 years worth of being able to go back and look at, at code examples. Where do you start, right? Yeah. Do you have to learn everything that you do from scratch every single time you do it? Mm -hmm. Or can you ask something to focus on that outcome, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, Lexi, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think kind of to Adrian's point, I remember in elementary school going to the computer lab, but it wasn't, it wasn't in 1983, though. <laughs> no, not 1983. And you would go to the computer lab, but it was to learn how to type. It was to learn how to use tools. It wasn't understanding how the computer itself works. Right. I actually had to take an elective in college to understand the back end of a computer. I was like, you can code. Right. I, I learned to code, but it, we were not learning how to use it for a computer. It was for fun. We were building like Frogger games and stuff like that. So. That's something that I had to do on my own volition in secondary education in college. Mm. Um, yeah, for me, I just, and I think it's an interesting generational gap because for generations that have been brought up on technology, sure, they don't understand the back end, but they are pretty intuitive and can figure most things out. And then, so even though we don't understand the back end, we can just make most things fix. But with the generative AI and chat GPT and everything that's coming in that space, you might even lose some of that understanding of how to immediately understand how a device would work because you can ask the device to pull something for you yeah. rather than looking in the C drive to find the file that you lost somewhere. But ultimately, does that matter, right? Exactly. If, you're, if, if, if the goal of the computer is to give you the meaningful result, mm -hmm. right, then then that's fantastic. So outcome, outcome, outcome. yeah, it's, it's outcomes, right? And yeah. again, like, is it coming from my job? I don't think so. I think what it's coming to do is is take away that like reinvesting in the process over and over again. Mm -hmm. And I'm excited about that. I mean, it's it, it. The goal is to make hard, hard analytics easy, and that would give me back so much of my day. Yeah. Um, and speaking of the kinds of tasks, so it'd be so much easier your day. Lexi, I'll ask you first. What kinds of tasks does AI tackle, or examples? So that's I have a couple of use cases because I mean, to be honest, as we all know. Um, Copilot is not generally available yet, so a lot of their use cases are going to be based on specifically what Microsoft has released. Um, so the big one that we were discussing earlier is for a sales use case. So if you are in a sales role, you may have used Viva Sales previously, but um, there is now going to be a sales copilot that, of course, plays nice with um, any copilot for Outlook. And so what you can do is have it give you meeting notes previously to prepare for a meeting. Then in that meeting, it will give you sales coaching and it will pull up competitor information if you're, um, if the potential client says, well, what about this company? It will list out strengths and weaknesses of that competitor. And then, yeah, you had a great meeting. After that meeting, it will basically write a follow-up email for you with action items and um, already know who to attach to the email um, and make it all nice and pretty and friendly. Um, so it's it's really amazing what it can do. And same with like Copilot for Excel, it can do, um, it can create graphs. So what you can do is say, I want to create a PowerPoint based on this Excel file. And what it'll do is it will, it will create, it'll take all that data, analyze it, create meaningful, easy to digest and understand um, graphs and charts and images. Then it'll pull that into a PowerPoint and really just make it a way easier. We were talking about this earlier. There are so many times in a creative landscape where that be just being creative or creating PowerPoints or Word documents or communications where you have that barrier of entry to just start, get words on the paper, even come up with a title sometimes. So this can help bridge that gap and really let you focus on adding the information that you know is helpful and what you specialize in because as we talked about and it's not going to take your job you have that human touch and that information that the computer can't pull on because it can't read your mind as of now they still make that disclaimer <laughs> <laughs> i just want this to you know go out of style it's deterring away from the doomsday <laughs> i'm just saying as of now for probably a couple hundred years but yes it'll be interesting to see how it is applicable in other cases, but there are some really obvious use cases right now um, that I personally look forward to seeing happen. And like Adrian was talking about, just making everything easier so you can really focus yeah. on getting your job itself done and not these small administrative tasks or repetitive tasks. 
Well, yeah, I want to call on, on our previous body of webinar recordings too, which by the way are out on YouTube and right. So this will be out on YouTube and, and we'll be able to reference this as well. Mm -hmm. But uh, Jeff Lau did a whole series on yeah. the, our platform, right? And he did uh, some some actual like Azure Open AI implementations. And, and incidentally, so as we're kind of talking about this, right? There's Azure Open AI and there's Copilot, and there's going to be some overlaps and capabilities. And there's going to be a lot of different copilots for a lot of different workloads. But Jeff Lau went and he did specifically at the Power Platform, and he yep. used the Forms Recognizer to recognize a receipt that was then scanned in to handle into some like sort of document tracking or billing solution, right? And and you know. Those are the sort of things that are very practical, very right now, right? Because we're talking about ingesting large amounts of historical data for organizations. And how do you do that? How do you get that data in? Yeah. But then when you're also applying it to like the tasks that can handle right now, like you mentioned generating a PowerPoint. I was asked just a couple of weeks ago to produce a 10 slide yeah. deck on why a customer should target a Windows 11 upgrade right now. And, you know, there are a lot of great ideas and a lot of great minds out there. And to your point, it's just sometimes hard to figure out where to start, where to put pen to paper, where to get going. And if you can simply, again, focus on outcomes, say, give me 10 slides on, you know, salient points for Windows 11 now, and then just go back and add your branding, go back and add your tone, go back and add things that are that are that are missed. That's 80% of the work done for you, right? Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it, it's just it's absolutely astonishing. And and again, we talk about like AI kind of at a high level with the the three basic categories of work being um, classification, linear regression, and clustering. Mm -hmm. Linear regression is yeah. where it's at, right? So linear regression is being able to take a, a set of data and figure out where there may be anomalies in that data, and then drawing long the long term forecasting out mm -hmm. of it. And, and in the co-pilot sense, that's just asking Excel to analyze a document for you and find out forecasting. And, and I was trying to, uh, to do something very specific uh, with regard to both family budgeting mm -hmm. and also with with long term. Uh, you know, I, I'm a cyclist, right? We don't we don't budget, we don't hedge around that. I, I very much am active in it. This is a company full of triathletes. We are all focused on trying to drive training. And I found recently that some of my models for uh, macronutrients weren't actually getting me where I wanted, and I had to go back and do a regression model, but I had to do it one by hand, right? And I had to not only do it by hand, but I also had to try to figure out what were the points I was trying to draw from it. Yeah. Whereas literally with Copilot, I could say, draw me a linear regression of macronutrients and forecast two or three different outcomes, right? And that's that's just what it does. Yeah. So all of this work that I was trying to figure out how to do for myself is just baked in. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Um, so, and actually, so going off that, we're talking about like everything is capable, but I know one of the biggest concerns right now is securing it. And that's like where companies need to start. So as we're talking about analyzing all of this data, is AI going to expose my company's secrets to the internet? So obviously there are a lot of different, and if you're welcome to take this one if you want to, but- um, Your there's, security. Yeah, right, there's a yeah, this, this, is, this is sort of uh, where I've been focused, right? And and actually I did an on the bike video a couple months ago talking mm -hmm. about concerns with this before we had some of the details that have come out. Um, so, so there are a lot of different implementations of AI. Microsoft is certainly not the only one at the party, right? There's yeah. there's a lot of companies that are rushing to get stuff out there. Uh, everybody's very familiar with tools like ChatGPT and what is it, Copy AI, and there's, they all have all these different sources. In those public models, when you ask it a question, you could be feeding the generative, uh, or you could be feeding the model itself, right? Mm -hmm. So if you ask it about top secret widgets, well, now it knows about top secret widgets, right? So it's a reasonable concern. Yeah. With the way that we are implementing Copilot in the Microsoft stack, the models that are delivered into your environment are, they're pre-trained language models. However, once they land in your tenant, they are then grounded to your information. And that grounding, is looking at uh, it's creating what's called a semantic index where it looks through all of your data and all of your metadata 
and exposes only back to the user that content which they would have already had permissions to access anyway. Mm -hmm. And it's using a technology that they're calling they're calling no search search, right? So you're still interacting with the same search queries, right. but before it searches the internet, which it's generally you know, intended not to do, it will first look to see if that content exists available in your organization. And if it does, mm -hmm. it's going to associate that with security boundaries, and it's going to only return back data about content that it knows about that you're exposed to, right? So, so the security of the data already in place will define the security of the co-pilot experience. Right. If you're oversharing, if you're publicly exposed, there's, there may be a risk. Uh, but if you've got your security plans in place, if you have a data governance plan, if you have you know, all of that kind of stuff ready when the semantic index comes to ingest your environment, produce it and turn around your results back to users, no, there's no, there's no, there's no risk by asking the co-pilot AI for assistance because again, it's only surfacing answers that that user would already be able to access. And Lexi, to your point, we were having a conversation earlier. It's correct. So it's correct. The only like, last use of only twenty five thousand words. Correct. Yes. yes. And so, really, that means it's more focused on. It's more conversational. So how you would present things. It's going to learn the way that you speak. Like for example. I am very peppy in my writing and you can tell it in my blogs. There's lots of exclamation points and and high energy. Um, whereas like if Adrian's going to write a very technical blog, it needs to be very, very technical, fact based and almost serious. Um, Have you read my stuff? <laughs> I know there's a few Star Wars references uh, baked in there as well. See, she she is not the A model. She's the A model. Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm not. Um, but yeah, and I think it's also important to note when Adrian uh, mentioned semantic index, if you want to hit on, um, that's not going to just automatically start indexing your environment. That's correct, right? No, so there's a there's a service. So Copilot itself, the Microsoft 365 Copilot, is not yet generally available. It's in a private preview. Uh, it's very, it's private, very private. private. It's very limited, right? There were initially only 20 customers. They opened yeah. it up to, was it 600, 600 yeah. right? Um, and it's not opening up beyond that. In the short term, we don't expect it to be generally available until calendar year 24. So there's a little bit of a runway and time for organizations to get ready. But before anybody gets access to Copilot, a service will be enabled on the back end called the semantic index. And that's what's going to go in and reach and through and read all the metadata and the content around your environment. It's very similar to the way that Windows has been indexing your PC for the last 20 some years, right? Mm -hmm. Except that before this is turned on, tenant admins and global admins will be notified, will be given opportunities to opt out if you so choose, but I don't recommend it, um, you know, uh, of that indexing. So you will be notified before your content is ingested. Um, but yeah, it's we're, we're looking at a runway of time to prepare for these tools, and there will be notifications along the way before they happen. Microsoft is making updates. Is that ethical AI? Because I know they're focusing on that. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So yeah. everything that that's happening, and you took the test. So yes. do you remember the six principles? Then it's not a test, right? Either. Okay. Transparency, reliability, security, inclusion. Oh, safety. Sa oh, yes, yeah, safety. safety. Yeah. I think there's one more. I think, I think so too. It's the, I think my idea. Yeah, it's it's ethical AI, right? So again, it's it's and and this is the difference. In, well, again, there are a lot of players in the AI space, right? Mm -hmm. And again, it's that element of trust. And Microsoft has been very specific about being transparent with everything they do, everything that Copilot will be able to do, everything that OpenAI will be able to do, mm -hmm. must be transparently explained in some easy to understand language in public documentation, right? Mm -hmm. So there's not going to be some secondary mining, some secondary farming, some secondary, you know, nefarious purpose. And I'm not going to say that any other commercially available product is doing nefarious content, but right. you need to make sure that anybody you get into an AI relationship with has clear, transparent uh, statements of how they will use the data that's exposed to them. And that's that's why Microsoft is so focused on commenting or, or, or clarifying their position as ethical AI. Yeah. Everything that is being done is being reported back to you, is being you know done with these principles of transparency, fairness, openness, inclusion, all of it. Do your due diligence. Yes, absolutely. I love due diligence. <laughs> um, 
So and you were just talking about to how organizations get started in terms of deploying Copilot or what they need to do in the organization first. How do you train the models? Well, I think the first thing you need to do is prepare for the enablement of the semantic index, right? So we know we have this runway of time right now mm -hmm. uh, between, you know, yesterday Inspire being over and, and sometime early next year, right? When, when, when the previews open up a little bit more. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's, that's that time where we need to start focusing on having a, a, a real data governance plan, right? shoring up data security, shoring up data retention, uh, making sure that actually the, the data that you want the semantic index to reason over is in a place that it can be accessed by the semantic index, right? So, uh, and that's actually one of the interesting things that, that just came out of, uh, of Inspire was they announced the long awaited uh, capabilities around Microsoft 365 backup and archive. And right. they announced them as part of an AI push. And that it took me a minute to understand why that was part of the syntax uh, mm -hmm. ecosystem. And the reality is what they're finding is that as these private preview customers are ingesting massive amounts of data into the cloud to have it reasoned over, mm -hmm. in some cases, they're also running into cloud storage uh, quotas, mm -hmm. right? So once you get all that data in and you reasoned over it and you've decided how you want it to be indexed, well, should it also always be online or should it be parked? So again, it's it's a it's a end-to-end -end data governance discussion, but it's also about making sure that you're not overprotecting your content, right? Maybe there's something that you want to be able to ask about some product, but right now you should know that it exists, but you shouldn't know the technical details of it. The way that we would have traditionally done this in a data governance environment is you wouldn't know about it at all. Yeah. Right? There'd be no access for you. But in some cases, that may be too restrictive for the co-pilot solutions to come back and give you a meaningful result. So we want to make sure that we're not we're not opening the doors, but we're not so closing things down that it, that it can't be meaningful. So there's data governance, but there's also data usage and, and workload usage. And we did a webinar uh, a few months ago yeah. where we talked specifically about using the tools in the Microsoft 365 dashboards to track the adoption. And, yeah. and one of the things that was really fascinating in that one is in preparing for it, I really saw a lot of neat insights on how users are interacting with teams, not just like, are they posting messages, but like, are they hosting meetings in the channel? Are they engaging with the meeting chat after mm -hmm. the meeting is over? And it turns out that those metrics and those insights will be critical in understanding or, or enabling Copilot to give back the best experience for those users. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, you know, I we we have a uh, a, a, uh, a readiness assessment that just went yeah. live in the the Microsoft. Uh, yeah, we're one of the we were one of the first Microsoft partners to actually get a Copilot readiness assessment yeah. in the Microsoft catalog. Yeah. Yeah, and 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 it goes into a lot of that, right? We do a lot mm -hmm. around you know discovery of data governance, uh, discovery of identity, of identity and access management, and actually even further than some of those and actually going into looking at some of the processes themselves, right? Mm -hmm. um, identifying key stakeholders and, and, and you know, chasing all this kind of stuff that, that helps not just turn it on and everybody's going to go have a great time, but to make sure that that the early adoption looks tremendously successful to make sure that early adoption doesn't create these scenarios like it did years ago with Delve, where organizations turn it on and accidentally mm -hmm. realize that content is overexposed, right? So, so we want to, we, we, we are absolutely committed to making sure that as part of this readiness assessment, you know, you know what you have, you know what the semantic index is going to reason mm -hmm. over, and you know how it's going to be able to be used by the users of the environment. Yeah. And I didn't mean to, I should have asked what kind of prep work do we need to plan for Copilot before I asked about training modules. But um, Lexi, can I ask you, what is indexing and will customers be able to opt out? One yeah. on the same team. So, in the, yeah, so we talked about indexing with like the semantic index. So mm -hmm. um, it's just going to be, again, you're, you will be notified, so you can opt out. Um, to my knowledge, that would impact or perhaps prohibit the ability to use Copilot if you're not doing the indexing in your environment. Um, and Adrian can fact check me on that because <laughs> I know that he's got some notes on that. Um, do you fact check? Well, so the, you know, the, again, I did mention you you can opt out, but right now it looks like the, the the easiest way to opt out is to simply not have the right licensing that pre qualifies you, right? So, um, so yeah, Microsoft three sixty five Copilot is is 
going to be available. And I don't know if this is going to be initial or long term or what, but what we know right now is that there will be qualifying licensing and Copilot will be an add on to those. And they will be the Microsoft 365 E3 and E5. E5 business standard business premium. And yes, yes, uh, yes. So if you don't have those licensing, uh, th those licensing vehicles or those licenses, um, you're not going to get the email telling you that your semantic index is going to be enabled, right? That's, that's you're just not going to happen. Mm -hmm. And that was my next question. You're getting ahead of me. Sorry. The licenses. Um, that, I'm using I'm using Copilot internally, right? <laughs> to to predict. Yeah. Sorry. Oh yeah. yeah. Uh, well, that's being licensed. So like Teams Premium would be its own license, so that would be included. In it. There there were a lot of like requirements within. Yes, and and so there are a lot of different co-pilots yeah. and they do a lot of different things, but there are some overlaps and I, I do sense that this is going to be an area of ongoing confusion, mm -hmm. um, not just with customers, but even with uh, with sellers, right? Is is what does what is the right co-pilot to enable the right workload? And again, that's part of that readiness assessment is trying to figure out what is the right set of tools that we need to enable success. So there's Teams Premium that has AI built into it, but there's also Microsoft 365 Copilot. There's Sales yeah. Copilot that directly impacts Teams and Dynamic, but then there's also Dynamics Copilot, right? So yeah. there's going to be these overlaps and trying to understand, you know, if I want the meeting notes, but I only want them for pre-planned meetings, then Teams Premium does it. But if I want meeting notes for one-on-one, -on -one, as you and I discovered, then yeah. an ad hoc meeting that's not planned won't mm -hmm. allow you to do transcriptions, mm -hmm. even through Teams Premium. But there's Teams Copilot that will do exactly that, right? So so there's going to be overlaps, and, and the licensing vehicles will vary. But right now, while all of these things are are moving through different levels of availability, I, I wouldn't focus so much on trying to figure out what those look like long term. Mm -hmm. I would focus on preparing for how to enable those processes uh, so that, again, you can derive at outcomes. Yeah, and so to your point, and um, well, I'll ask you first. So a lot of customers are asking what applications are supported in Copilot, but I guess there's really no is there a right answer or is there same because it depends on to your point which pillow they're using it depends on what you're using and there's also going to be connectors and i know microsoft seems to be putting a big push on connectors um at least in the communications to us um so then these connectors would have some sort of capability with copilot in addition to copilot itself so that pulls in these third-party organizations that have no attachment to copilot or microsoft um mm -hmm. and based on the current documentation anything that has a teams any sort of offering within teams as an application or add-on will automatically the developers don't need to do anything will be one of these connectors for copilot so it, it'll be interesting to see who plays nice with that and what third-party connectors are on top of the original M365, the productivity, Windows. there's okay. Windows Copilot, there's Security Copilot, which we have. Um, I'd like to hear more about Security Copilot, actually. Um, there's been not much information that I can find about that. Uh, but yes, there's lots of Copilots and then third parties in addition of that. So it's going to be a lot. Yeah. It'll be and, very fun. And you know, Windows Copilot, like they, they just made the announcement that it's available in dev channel for Windows Insiders, right? Mm -hmm. And um, and you play with it. I, I, I did update to the dev channel, but you know, you should not be running dev <laughs> channel on a production device, right? Um, it's, it's, it is a, oh, it's yeah. an experimental playground and it is not appropriate for consuming business workloads, but they also at the same time en enabled the, the Bing chat enterprise too, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's all these different things that are coming in and, and at the same time that these tools are coming in, we're seeing, uh, license levels that had previously existed and we thought things were going to be added on top of that consuming some of those co-pilot workloads so not everything is going to be an add-on right so we're just not far enough into it yet to really understand what's going to be when these things become generally available right so microsoft made a big splash with announcing pricing for co-pilot mm -hmm. this week um and i frankly in all honesty based on years of watching the way that they do this. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't know that I would depend on that number being the actual real number 
when this product goes generally available next year. Yeah, they definitely have time. And we always so discussed all the various copilots across GitHub and 365 Security Copilot for you. So syntax versus copilot or slash copilot? And well, yes, it's interesting because uh, we definitely had that in the notes, but I don't think we've gotten there yet. So let's 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 talk about that, right? So because there actually is and has been AI in the Microsoft stack for years, uh, and it's not been called those things, right? It's it's not been called Copilot before. Um, Syntax was introduced at Ignite last year in the fall of 2022, and at the time it was like, well, you know. It's a weird licensing model, right? It's 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 an add-on to your SharePoint environment. And again, now this copilot or this this backup and archive is coming in through Syntax. But Syntax was doing in November of 22 a lot of what we're talking about copilot doing. But Syntax was doing it on some fairly narrow workloads. And now we're expanding that out to including everything from OneDrive to Loop to Teams to Outlook to PowerPoint, Excel, OneNote. I mean, all of it, right? Uh, yeah, so so Syntax sort of paved the way in the productivity side, right. but you mentioned purview. And yeah. so we did a webinar a year ago on purview and you know some stuff has changed since then, uh, but like it, it's, we had trainable classifiers in purview to identify data loss, mm -hmm. right? And those trainable classifiers literally are AI, right? That's exactly what they are. They are classification models that you have to train based on validation and testing sets to determine what is happening with this data. And then you are allowing that AI trainable classifier to reason over your data. So it's already there. And then we have adaptive protections in purview that popped up in the spring of this year too, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, being able to recognize a user's behaviors and say, these are disruptive to the way that my data governance plan is, is usually enabled and raising up alerts and blocking users from doing things in endpoint DLP. Windows auto patch has brought AI to patching Windows, Office, Edge, and now even drivers in machines. And you think, well, that's ridiculous. How is it AI? But it's, it's not just saying, deploy it to all of my machines by Friday, like we've been doing with uh, with with uh, Windows Update for Business, right. but it's also saying, these are my update rings, these are my deployment schedules, and now, how are the machines performing? Do I pause this update schedule because some of the machines are not performing at the level that they had been before? So we are truly already at a point where AI has come in and it is being allowed to reason over a lot of what we're doing. Uh, and it's just a matter of, of you know, accepting a branding and deciding how much more we want to allow users to directly interact with it. Right. And I know we kind of touched on this earlier, but um, let's see, I'll ask you, can you clarify what is like the biggest difference between Copilot and ChatGPT? So Copilot uses your internal database. So ChatGPT is basically like what we're talking about, no search, search. Yeah. It's you ask it a question and then it it gives you a response and you don't have to go searching for the right answer or the answer that's the most accurate to your situation. Um, and then Copilot itself is basically like that, but it's for internal use. And actually one of the uh, versions of Copilot or applications of Copilot is a company-wide chatbot. And so it is for stuff like HR documents or maybe asking about, do we have Friday off or something? Um, you know, important things. And so Copilot is going to be a company document base, but it is also based, there is a knowledge base there since it's pre-trained in actual information, but mm -hmm. it, one of the applications is a chatbot, but it's not just checked. It's everything as we've discussed, it's everything in the Microsoft suite for the most part. Mm -hmm. So it, it'll be interesting to see the uses in that situation. Yeah, and one of the neat things that I've seen uh, with uh, with Copilot implementations for my job, right, is I build demo environments. Mm -hmm. And the, the very first time I ran into a scenario, I was like, I really want this. Because uh, again, you know, cloud was a joke, AI was a joke, mm -hmm. right? But moving past that, the very first time I saw where I really wanted this was somebody wrote a GitHub uh, project that allows you to go in and create a demo M365 tenant with X number of users with Y number of years of pre-existing data. So you can say, 
uh, you can ask you can you ask the prompt to generate a conversation between five employees on a juicy gossip topic topic. Yeah. I mean, literally, that's one of the things that's in there, right? So you can use that then to then feed into the trainable classifiers in purview to detect from like an insider risk management perspective. Is there targeted harassment, profanity, that sort of stuff? So like all of these things are feeding back into each other. But that was the first time I saw, oh my gosh, like I could really speed my time to outcomes mm -hmm. because I wouldn't have to go in and manually produce all this. I can just ask it to do it and it just does it. You don't assign this a Dell Vance anymore. I mean, you know, we miss her. I know, I know. I, I I do miss some of the stock characters, but um, but I mean yeah it's it's just so much easier and then again to turn around and make that back into a presentation where instead of having to go in and format the presentation I mean, you talk, you you asked me uh either today or yesterday how is this different from the built-in designer tool that's in yeah. powerpoint right and and that's and i was initially confused because microsoft designer is an ai solution designed yeah. to to do like uh light touch you know dolly equivalent stuff for marketing uh, but the reality is if I go into PowerPoint and I give it a whole bunch of information, the designer element will show me ways that I can format it, but it instantly loses all of the branding data. That's so right, it's yeah. not. That's why Ken, I don't make a separate bit. Exactly. It's why we don't use it. And every time I've played with it, I've, I've just kind of been like, okay, this would be great if I already knew what I was trying to do and I just didn't have the visual uh, acuity to, to put it together. The co-pilot experience is even more fundamental. It's just bring in the data and then lay it in on top of the, the, the templating that we already have with our branding and then just I'll clean it up and, and change some of the, the points to match what I'm trying to say. It's 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 so much more than just designer. Well, and I thought I asked this question out of turn. That makes a lot of sense now how to train the models that we talked about earlier to point it's only as good as the data it has access to. Absolutely. Garbage in, garbage right. out. <laughs> yep, garbage in, garbage out. And that's, you know, we 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 were talking uh, initially uh, about some of like the uh, the 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 real world gotcha moments for AI where Chat GPT mm -hmm. and Copy AI and all these other ones that are out there uh, have been tripped up right there. Dan Finn, our VP of sales, loves to tell the story of how uh, you know there was a lawyer in New York who turned in reference material that referenced a case that didn't exist and it was simply AI generated. Um, and then there was always, you know, people don't think about this as being AI, but the whole, your honor, I am not a cat, right? The, the chat, the, the Snapchat filters, that's AI. That's looking at an object, identifying where it is in space and then casting objects on top of it, right? Mm -hmm. If you think that's just AR, the reality is that AR has been around for as long as the cloud, but it used to rely on having these little cards that you could put on the desk and mapping mm -hmm. things above it. Anything beyond that, where we're mapping real objects in space, tracking how they move and putting things on that, that is vision-based AI. Which everyone has another thing everyone talks about how impressive it is, because everyone uh, goes to concern, you can't believe any picture you see on the internet, because you can just literally tell AI. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, again, ethical AI ethical is, is, is where it's at, right? So garbage in, garbage out, Not right? Pilot, and then no. ethical AI. Right. Uh, but the third stack on that, and this is another one that we've been talking about internally, is, you know, you, you still have a responsibility to have your hands on the wheel with gener with turning out real content. You can ask something like, listen, I'm not a great writer, but I know I've got to turn out some document, a blog post or whatever. It gets you started. You still have to tweak that because yes. if you don't tweak that, that becomes the content that then feeds the AI and feeds yep. the AI. And what is being found is that in long term studies, AI models that feed on themselves collapse quickly. Mm -hmm. Right. So, you know, again, none of this is intended to simply come in and replace the human element. The human element is still massively critical. Verifying that what it's producing is truly what you expect of it is a critical component or else you will create a garbage in garbage out scenario. Yes. Uh, and so that's that point uh, we were talking about earlier. If, if you know, AI was going to take all of our jobs, um, do you think Copilot will take away the need to learn the technology? I hope so. I desperately Out hope so. Outcomes. Yeah, I want to focus on outcomes. I don't want to be lost in process, right? Every time I have to go back and again, PowerShell, it's going to take me a day at least to figure mm -hmm. out. And then I'm going to spend half of that day trying to figure out if somebody else has already just published that code on the internet, right? 
So if I could just turn around and ask it a question and have that code, and we've seen with GitHub Copilot that you can take something that exists there and translate it directly and immediately into any number of other programming languages and including PowerShell output. Hands off the wheel, man. Like just just give me the code. Just give me the thing well, that you learned it last time. Yeah. You want right. Curve stack overflow. Yeah. No, I, I outcomes. So we're getting into last everyone, please, by the way, drop questions in where we've got about 15 minutes left. If you have any questions other than these last couple, please drop them in the chat. But next, um, this is a big one. How are other companies progressing in the development of agreed upon protocols and guidelines into AI? So <laughs> you're more plugged in on that than I do. I that's yes. a nice question. So I think again, it, you've seen a lot of news stories talking about the discussions about creating some sort of regulations or laws or even litigation around, um, you know, AI. Like we talked about, your honor, I'm not a cat, or um, <laughs> or talking about like referencing material that doesn't exist. So there's really no guidelines from a legal standpoint, but that doesn't mean free reign. We discussed this earlier. It's you're under the compliance regulations that you're already under. So say you're under PCI or GDPR, you need to respect that compliance in Copilot or whatever AI you choose to implement. But it's just saying there's no additional um, or a change in regulations around AI. From a company standpoint, you know, I've read a lot about companies having sandboxes to kind of before this stuff goes live, monitoring the way that their employees are interacting. So to make sure they're not putting confidential information into something like ChatGPT and then that becomes ChatGPT's knowledge base. Um, but Copilot kind of is your own sandbox because it is based in internal knowledge bases that you define based on your data protection standards. So even if someone else in the company has access to it, if that user is not supposed to see it, they won't as long as you did your labels right. Um, but so it is you don't necessarily need guidelines because it's based on how you have your own privacy set up, but still follow all laws and all your compliance regulations. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, and that's and that's part of what we we discuss a lot in these readiness assessments too. It's yeah. like making sure that that the data that you already have aligns with your privacy risks, your governance risks, your mm -hmm. compliance risks, all, all of that. So all that GRC program that you already have is going to come into play, and it's going to need to be really hammered out and really well codified. What I will say from a security perspective, and, and we touched on this a little bit, is not all AIs are created equally, right? And, and it goes back to that trust element. Um, and the, the one that, that I see referenced pretty regularly is, is the one that allows you to take your 10 favorite pictures of yourself and create profile pictures, right? <laughs> and and I'm, not, I'm not trying to throw you one to left. It's not a personal attack. So, you know, from a security perspective, I'm always looking at like, how are biometrics being used yeah. to help protect access to data. And you know, one of the neat things in Windows Hello for Business is that I can obviously use my face, I can use my fingerprint, uh, and, and, and we're always looking for that next uh, magical uh, uh, biometric that's um, you know, easy to protect, right? Um, Displayable only on demand, right? The, the tongue print, right? Yeah. That's not gonna happen. Um, but you know, we, have, we have irises, we have faces, we have th fingerprints. When we give some third party access to all of that and the only thing that we get as a promise out of it is a cleaned up picture of ourselves i think we have to ask what else are they doing with that data and if they have clear published guidelines on that fantastic if they don't i would be hesitant to engage with that particular ai because my theory is that that could then be used to trip other security mechanisms right well and Lexi, where are you telling me a story the other day about, so to your point about pictures, but audio voice as well. So there's that yes. iconic scam that, you know, someone calls you and says, hey, your grandmother's in the hospital and you do the movie $5,000, but now they can call in your voice. Yes, they can. Remember the whole movie Sneakers, right? My voice is my passport, right? Yeah. I mean, that's that we're we're past that now. Uh, yeah. Um, so, and we did touch on Copilot for PowerShell. Mm -hmm. You are so excited about coding. Um, so when will some of the autopilot features be released to the general populations? So again, I think we're looking, we, we, we've heard a lot of back and forth on that, right? So again, we started with 20 uh, customers that were in the, the paid private preview program mm. that then got expanded to 600. 
Um, we're, we're looking at, I believe, early calendar year 24. Uh, there have been murmurs that the pilot, the early access pilot may be expanded. Uh, there have been a couple of confusingly worded press releases. Um, uh, KPMG. Yeah, that looked like that maybe the pilot programs were expanding, but really what it what it really boiled down to was that they were enabling it for their own internal business groups and then turning out third party solutions uh, to enable other capabilities for their own customers leveraging the Azure OpenAI capability. So again, Azure OpenAI has been around and, and a lot of what is in that space has been generally available since 2019. Uh, and purview capabilities have been around and mostly generally available since last year. Um, Teams Premium is available, it has been since March, but the Microsoft 365 sales copilot, yep, sales copilot, right? Sometimes they just yep. draw. So, but but the one that I think everybody's, you know, focused on right now is, you know, the, the, the productivity enablement in Microsoft 365, and that one as a as an add-on license to M365 E3 and E5 business standard and business premium, mm -hmm. we expect to see opened up early calendar year 24. Hopefully. And I apologize if I um, watch this in long big words, but so one of our clients is interested in leveraging the Document Intelligence Studio, formerly known as the Form Recognizer Studio, to report ESG reporting from utility invoices. Okay. Pause. So that is probably going to be more of an open AI play where you're going to be looking mm -hmm. at, you know, having a test data set, a validation data set, and trying to figure out what is what what are the the models and training that specifically. Mm -hmm. um, it could end up being a copilot scenario. We do know we initially thought that that, or at least I initially thought that copilot was going to be much more language model based and not so much on the analytics side. But we are seeing that there's a lot that's going to happen with the actual asking it to do the analysis and having it come back. Mm -hmm. uh, we've also had OCR in OneDrive and, uh, you know, uh, and, and your camera you know, on your phone for years, mm -hmm. right? So um, I, I don't know what the, the right answer will be necessarily, but the tools exist today in the open AI side. And again, Jeff Lau did that great webinar. Yeah, uh, uh, from yeah, and, the Microsoft Build Recap where he touched on yeah. our platform co-pilot. Yeah, we'll make sure that's over your head in the YouTube okay. recording on this. Yep, I'm out there. Yeah, no, Jeff did a great job with that. Yeah, really um, but so that was our last question. Um, I, I do, oh wait. All right. So how does the pilot ensure compliance with data privacy regulations, security standards, and other government requirements? It won't. <laughs> That's up to your pre-work before you enable Copilot for your users, right? So that's again, that whole like having a solid data governance plan. Copilot is simply going to enable users to pull back meaningful results from content they have access to. So it's governing, it's making sure that the governance is in place to make sure that they have the right access. It's gonna be conditional access. It's gonna be role-based access controls. It's gonna be all of the stuff mm -hmm. that, that has been part of the best practices for some time. Uh, and and making sure that there is a business alignment with those compliance regulations and the way that, that your data governance strategy uh, is played out. Mm -hmm. Right, and going back to our that's our copilot writing assessment. I feel like the two fundamental aspects of our, are the compliance and data governance and like identity access management. Yeah. the four things that we look at. Uh, which, if anyone is interested, uh, please reach out to us about that because I will happily get you in touch for if you're. New to Synergy family, or if you already have an AE, I know I think Dan Finn is on the phone. Promise, um, he would love to talk to you, as would any of us. Um, and actually, and we're talking about all these updates that are coming out. Surprise! This is one of two webinars uh, starting us in um, our co-pilot series. So actually, on August seventeenth, and um, if you're interested, I'm sending the landing page out with the recording of this webinar tomorrow. Uh, but our, actually, our president and CEO, Ron Mead, our VP of Delivery, Clay West Bay, and uh, Dan Finn, our VP of Sales, are actually going to do a similar panel discussion where they're going to talk more, I think, from a leadership and strategy perspective on like how you can drive innovation with your organization and how to secure it, how to prepare for it, what does it look like. Uh, so this is, will be one of the most important. And if I can add just one thing too, I mean, so again, we'll we'll make sure the links to these are in the, yep. in, the, the in the recording. Uh, but you know, we we did do Jeff Lau had his conversation, right? Mm -hmm. We'll make sure the link is there. Uh, we did a uh, that the usage and adoption, which is yep. critical, right, to making sure that that users are actually engaging with the workloads correctly. Mm -hmm. oh, Dan and I also did that fireside chat. 
late last year. For Viva uh, Sales. Which, yeah. which was focused on Viva yeah. Sales, right? And that's the new sales co-pilot. It's just yeah. been rebranded. So we have a lot of great content that's already out there. Mm -hmm. uh, highly encouraged. If you want to dig deeper into some of those specific tool sets, like those, those, that webinar series is, is a great starting point. Um, well, I'm not seeing any more questions, but first of all, thank you all. I know that was a lot of content, a lot of big words to cover in an hour. Um, and if anyone has any more questions, please again, reach out and we will get you either an answer or in contact with the right person to answer it. Um, but thank you all and thank you for attending. Uh, so you will again, like I said, receive the recording of this webinar by tomorrow with the landing page. I might be sending a lot of points, so I apologize in advance, but it's such great content. I can't emphasize enough like these, you know, and Jeff Lau and everyone else, they know exactly what they're talking about. Um, and the co-pilot ready stuff, so I'll put that one too. Yeah. Um, but with that, I always say I'll quote my boss because he always says, we'll give you six minutes back in your day. Um, but thank you everyone for joining us. And I hope you